Good afternoon and welcome to another one of our comparative religions classes. Today we're going to be looking at a religious group that is very prominent in the Middle East, a very long history of involvement in many of the affairs of that uh, region of the country. But as we will see, this is a group that also is very deeply involved with syncretism. The group we'll be talking about today are known as the Druze, and we'll find them in Syria and in Lebanon, in Israel, and in the Golan Heights. That's the primary, er primary areas where they are operating. So we'll get started with this now, and a little reminder of what we're looking at. Syncretism comes from the Greek words syn, sin, and kres, which was Crete, the island of Crete. The syncretism means originally that it was an alliance of Cretans, a nation that would join forces with other people in order to fight against their enemies. And so this word has come to basically mean a union of communities or combining together against a common enemy. You join together with another, kind of like NATO, for example. The United States and countries of, of Western Europe join together for a mutual defense pact. Uh, that's, that's syncretism, uh, unity of these things. But in our world, it also has taken on a religious connotation. It is the fusion of diverse religious beliefs and practices. And what happens here in syncretism, uh, we have a lot of mystery religions. We have Judaism, Christianity, Islam and Greek religious philosophical concepts. And what will happen is a religious group will begin to take pieces from all of these things. Last time we were here, we were talking about Zoroastrianism, a very ancient religion that created a lot of ideas that were later on then borrowed and used by Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Uh, we're gonna look at some of this and how this works out in our world today uh, with uh, the group we're looking at uh, known as the Druze, where they have taken a little bit of this, a little bit of that, they've combined it all together and have created an entirely new religious tradition. So here we go with the Druze. Uh, that's the common spelling, but you can also sometimes see it spelled D-R-U-S-E. Uh, it's still the same group of folks. They are a monotheistic religious and social community primarily found in Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and Jordan. They call themselves the al atawid the people of monotheism, or al muwahidin the Unitarians. These are the ways they understand themselves. Monotheistic, Unitarian belief in one God. The name Druze is derived from the name of a man who was called Mohammed bin Ismail Nashtakin Ad Darzai. He was an early preacher of this tradition. And the interesting thing is, um, they consider him, the founder of the religion, to be a heretic. But the name has always been used to identify this group of people. The movement was always secretive, and all of its meetings are closed. They were called sessions of wisdom, and only insiders could be a part of this, and no outsiders were ever, uh, ever incorporated into the tradition. Ad Arze had a belief that God was incarnated in human beings. Uh, one of the people that he believed was uh, the incarnation of God was Ali ibn Ali, Abi Talib, who was the cousin and son-in-law of Muhammad, the founder of Islam. Um, Al-Darazi believed that this man was actually God incarnate, and this became a part of their religious tradition. Al-Darazi <coughs> named himself the Sword of the Faith, and thereby doing so, he took on almost a divine status. Hamza ibn Ali ibn Ahmed, another early leader of this faith tradition, opposed al-Darazi and most likely had him assassinated. A very common thing that happened in the ancient world. 
During the period of the Crusader rule in Syria, beginning around the year 1099 and going to about 1291, almost 200 years, the Druze first emerged in the mountains of Lebanon and of Syria. The Druze were given the task of keeping watch over the Crusaders in the seaport of Beirut with the aim of preventing them from making any encroachments inland. They basically formed a barrier or a buffer between the Christian crusaders who were in uh, Beirut and the Islamic uh, people that were all over the rest of the area of Syria and Lebanon. Uh, they became that kind of a buffer zone and very fiercely, uh, very fierce warriors uh, at, at this particular point in time. And this is where they first begin to raise up in uh, prominence in the region. Because of their fierce battles with the Crusaders, they earned the respect of the Sunni Muslim caliphs and gained important political power. They were fierce warriors, and they were able to hold back the invasion of the Crusaders for a long period of time, and uh, they became very prominent in the, in the time period. The interesting thing, however, was that even in this beginning stages, the Druze have turned away from Islam but the uh, Sunni Muslims saw them as a very good ally to have. And then when we begin the reign of the Ottoman Empire, the fortunes of the Druze population changed radically. The Ottomans began to see the Druze as a danger and subjected them to very serious persecution and were trying to force the members of this religious group to uh, convert back to being Sunni uh, Muslims. A uh, lot of very difficult time period for them. Still, the Druze not only survived, but they thrived. They are known for their loyalty to the countries they reside in. Wherever they live, their loyalty is first and foremost to the nation and that makes them very good citizens. They maintain a very strong community feeling, and they identify themselves even if they live in other parts of the world. Uh, you're living in Syria, and you encounter somebody uh, from Israel who is a Druze, they're your family. Everybody is interrelated. This is a strong community feeling that holds them all together across the boundaries of all of the different countries, and yet, they're fiercely loyal to the place in which they live. The Druze social customs differ markedly from those of Muslims or of Christians. Very different cultural structure. They are known to form a very close-knit and a very cohesive social community. They are all basically looking at each other as interrelated and interdependent. And they don't let in outsiders. They are very, very tight uh, communities. But given that, they fully integrate themselves into their adopted homelands. And this gives them a strength and a security, uh, even in the midst of some very serious opposition. As a people, they have no nationalistic vision. What they want to do is they want to be a good citizen no matter where they live, which is kind of interesting in our world because most groups want to be, own, uh, be their own country. They want to establish their own way of living. They want to be able to have their own power of political ruling. The Druze don't want that. They want to be able to live peacefully in whatever land they find themselves, and living peacefully, they want to be very, very good citizens. So they're not trying to form a Druze nation, such as what is happening with the Kurdish people in Syria and Turkey and um, in Iraq, of wanting to form a new country just for the, Turk, uh, just for the Kurdish people. Um, that, that's not going to happen with the Druze. They're not looking for that kind of role in the world. Now, what we have is a breakdown of about 40 to 50% of this uh, religious group live in the country of Syria. They are very loyal citizens of Syria, and they have pretty much sided with the government in the midst of all of the civil war that has been going on in Syria for over a decade now. 
30 to 40 percent of them live in Lebanon. Six to seven percent live in Israel. And one or two percent live in Jordan. So the the bulk of the population is in the area of, of Syria, but you can see they have spread out across most of the, the Middle East. About 2% of the Druze population are also scattered within other countries in the Middle East, such as Iraq, um, those kinds of things, Saudi Arabia, some of the other countries in the Middle East, but they have a very small percentage of the population that is out there. There's also large communities of expatriate Druze living outside of the Middle East. There are communities in Australia, Canada, Europe, Latin America, the United States, and surprisingly in West Africa. Uh, these communities are still, again, very close-knit, uh, very interrelated and interdependent, and yet if they're living in Australia, they're totally Australian. If they're living in, in the United States, they are totally American, and they want to be good citizens and live good, productive lives in the country where they find themselves. Now, the Druze speak Arabic as their main language, and they try to follow a social pattern similar to those of other people of the Levant, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean area. They want to try to follow the cultural traditions of Syria and Lebanon in particularly. Worldwide, <coughs> there are probably about one million Druze. There's about 104,000 that live in Israel. And another place where they live is uh, where there's a good population of them. There's about 18,000 who are living in the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights has been a contested area of uh, real estate for a very long time between Israel and Syria. And with the Druze living in that region, they have, again, once more, formed a kind of a buffer zone between the Syrians and the Israelis. Uh, very interesting uh, connection right there. The Druze community in Israel, surprisingly, has a very special standing among the country's minority groups. Members of this Druze community have attained high-level positions in the political, public life, and the military spheres of influence in Israel, simply because the Druze that are living in Israel are really deeply committed to the nation of Israel, to its safety, to its security, and they want to be a part of this nation. Not a, a chance to form their own country, but rather to be very, very good citizens in Israel. In 1948, with the establishment of the State of Israel, the Druze officially turned from Arab nationalism and they began to fully support Israel. Members of the Druze community first served as volunteers in the War for Independence in 1948. They served as volunteers with the Israel, Israel Defense Forces, and they fought for the protection of Israel. Later, they began to serve within the system of drafting in, uh, in Israel, and they serve also with the border police. They want to be good, productive citizens of Israel. And so they have chosen to align themselves with that from the very beginning of the institution of the State of Israel. They have been recognized as a distinct religious community. They have their own courts, they have their own system of jurisdiction in personal matters such as marriage, divorce, and adoptions. They have a great deal of autonomy and they continue to be very prominent people in the society and fiercely loyal to the country. Now, we go back to take a look at the origins here. And this faith began in Egypt as a movement of what was known as Ismailism, which was an offshoot of Shia Islam. Now, they have the traditions of the Shia, the Shiite uh, backings of Islam, but here we go, we're seeing the syncretism at work. Not only have they taken the traditions of Shia Islam, but they have 
uh, been influenced by Gnosticism, by Greek philosophy, and surprisingly enough, by Hinduism. They've taken a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, put it all together with their own traditions and have formed their own new religious group. The faith was proclaimed by Hamza ibn Ali ibn Ahmed in Egypt beginning in the year 1014 in the Common Era. Hamza gained the support of the Fatimid Caliph al-Hakim, closely tied to the Shiite tradition of Islam. And they started initially to do some proselytizing to get other people to join with them, but their act of proselytizing was a very brief period of time. By the year 1050 in the Common Era, this community is completely closed to outsiders. We're no longer going to try to get other people to join in the religion. We are basically going to be a very close-knit uh, community of uh, tradition. Al-Hakim became a central figure in the Druze faith. He was perceived in this Druze tradition as the manifestation and the reincarnation of God, presumably the image of God. This is Al-Hakim. He is the one that they look to as the leader of their tradition. Al-Hakim disappeared one night. It is presumed that he was assassinated. Nobody has ever seen him again, but their beliefs about him have continued on very strongly. They believe that Al-Hakim went into the occultation with Hamza and with other notable Druze preachers. The occultation is this out of space and time. It's another dimension. It's another place that we cannot physically see. But all of these wonderful leaders are there, and they are going to come back from that at some point in time. The occultation is a belief that was discovered in the Shiite tradition concerning the 12th Imam. There were 11 Imams who were the followers of Muhammad, each in succession, and the 12th one was supposed to take over and lead, and he went into this occultation, this uh, place, this safe sphere, which is removed from our world. It's, it's outside of our confines of space and time. It exists, but we can't see it. And Al-Hakim and other notable leaders are in this place. And it is believed that when Al-Hakim returns, he will bring justice to the earth. And so in that way, he continues this tradition that we have seen. It was something that was a part of Zoroastrianism. It has played a role in Judaism, in Christianity, and in Islam, where at some point in time, a messianic figure is going to appear who is going to bring about God's will for the world and bring about justice to the world. And this is what uh, they look forward to, is the return of Al-Hakim. The Druze consider their faith to be a new interpretation of the three principal monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, Judaism, of course, has its ancient roots. Christianity begins uh, in the period of time after the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Islam comes about uh, at a little bit later of time in around the 600, 700 time period. And now in the uh, year 1050 or so in the Common Era, uh, a new religion, a new interpretation, a better understanding of these um, monotheistic religions. Uh, we're taking it to the next level is the way we could look at this. For the Druze, the traditional story of creation is a parable. And the way they understand it is that the story in creation in Genesis chapter 1 describes Adam not as the first human being, but as the first person who ever believed in one God. And that's where Adam becomes prominent uh, in the history of religious uh, thought and idea. The ideas of monotheism, uh, they claim, have been passed on by emissaries or prophets guided by mentors 
who embody the spirit of monotheism. This is something that gets passed on from one generation to the next through the lives of certain prominent people. Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. Moses himself, of course. Uh, a, a man by the name of Simon the Persian. John the Baptist from the Christian tradition. Jesus, and of course, Muhammad. They, underste they understand that all of these people, and others as well, are reincarnations of the monotheistic idea. These are the emissaries or the prophets who have passed on and have lived out this spirit of monotheism, and they become the, the figureheads of the, the Druze tradition. The Egyptian Akhenaton, Greek philosophers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, wonderful leaders like Alexander the Great, were all considered to be advocates of justice, and they were all advocates of the belief in one God, and all are seen as emissaries. So it could be anybody from any tradition who has a prominent place in the world who is able to pass on their traditions, whether it's out of the, the traditions of Greek philosophy or Christianity or Islam or whatever. These are the ones who pass on these ideas and are the emissaries of monotheism. Although the Druze recognize all three monotheistic religions, they believe that certain rituals and ceremonies have caused Jews, Christians, and Muslims to turn aside from the pure faith. What the Druze are saying is as they develop their theology and begin to develop their practices and their rituals, what they say is everything that Judaism, Christianity, and Muslim, uh, Islam has done is to really turn away from the real ideas of monotheism. And so they're trying to recover this ancient monotheistic belief and tradition. They're trying to update it and make it into the new world. And although they recognize all three faiths, they argue that anybody who believes that God will forgive them if they fast and pray are, well, basically, they're, they're deluding themselves. What they say simply is this. If we're holding on to this belief that if we can pray for forgiveness, well, what happens here is we do something wrong and we pray asking to be forgiven and we believe that we are and then we turn around and do the same thing all over again. Do you ever tell a lie? Do you ever tell a lie and then ask for forgiveness for telling that lie? And then what did you do the next day? You told another lie. This is what they're saying. They argue that individuals who believe that God will forgive them are just going to keep on going on doing the same things over and over again. And that's not how we're supposed to live. So, the Druze conception of the deity is declared by them to be one of strict and uncompromising unity. The main Druze doctrine states that God is both transcendent and imminent. God is above us and beyond us, but God is also present. There are no attributes distinct from his essence. What they say is, God is wise, mighty, and just, not by wisdom, not by might, and not by justice, but God is wise, mighty, and just simply because that's what it means to be God. His own essence is wisdom, might, and justice. They have eliminated all elements of ritual and ceremony. They believe that these are the things that pull people away from the actual practice of the faith. Why need to be praying five times a day, such as the tradition of Islam? Prayer should be something that is always there, not just specific ceremonies and rituals. We don't need to have these other ceremonies to remind us of who we are. We don't need to celebrate the Passover because we remember that we have been freed by God. We don't have to do any of these rituals that are a part of the traditions, and we don't have to have any of these ceremonies. So they've eliminated all of that. There is no fixed daily literature. There are no defined holy days. And there are no obligations to go on a pilgrimage to any kind of special place. 
if you are a part of the Druze tradition, this is a part of your normal existence. You don't need to have these special things to make them happen. The Druze perform their spiritual reckoning with God at all times. And consequently, they do not need to have special days for fasting. They don't need to have a day of atonement. They don't need to have a season of Lent. They don't have the month of Ramadan to fast. These things aren't necessary in their tradition because this is something that you do all the time, every day, always. This is where you live your traditions and not have to have special occasions. The Druze believe their religion was only open to new believers for a space of a generation. It was first revealed and everyone was invited to join in, but then basically the door closed. And what they say, they have a very strong belief in reincarnation, and this is a part of what they have picked up out of Hinduism, is that everybody who is alive today is the reincarnation of somebody who lived back at that time during this first generation of belief of this new religion. And, well, there's no reason to have you join today because of reincarnation. You're back again, and you were a part of the community back then. Um, everyone alive is a part of the tradition. So we don't have to go out and reach out to other people and invite them to come in because... Well, they're already in. So the Druze refrain from proselytizing, and no member of another religion can ever become Druze. They have some very strict understandings and interpretations of how that gets played out. The Druze religion is very secret and is very close to converts, and so we don't know much about the inner workings uh, of the tradition. Uh, religious books are accessible only to the initiates, that is, the, uh, the ukal, they're known as the knowers. And there are much deeper levels of traditions, the yuhal, the ignorant ones, uh, accept the faith on the basis of the tradition handed down from generation to generation. You may not have the religious writings. They're not accessible to everyone. But you will be receiving the instructions and the traditions that are passed on from parent to child over the generations. The Druze believe that many teachings given by prophets, religious leaders, and other holy books all have an esoteric meaning. It's not just simply the story of face value, but there's more to the story than what you first read, a very esoteric understanding. The obvious meaning is something that could be uh, attained by anybody by reading it. Uh, pick any story that you would want to have out of the scriptures. Take the story of creation, Genesis chapter 1. You can read that and it can be obvious that in six days God creates the world and on the seventh day God rests and everything happens in this order. It's very obvious, accessible to everyone. Ah, the hidden is only accessible to those who are willing to search and learn. Did this really happen in six days? Did things really happen in the order that they were in? Is there some other meaning behind this text? And then there is the hidden of the hidden, inaccessible to all but a few really enlightened individuals who might be able to go back and say there is a special meaning in the story of the creation. And only the very enlightened individuals can ever get to that level of understanding and knowledge. There are no ceremonies. There are no rituals. There is no obligation to perform any precepts of the religion at all in public. You don't have to go to worship. You don't have to pray. You don't have to do anything. There's no special things to take place. The main tenets that obligate all Druze are as follows. This is what makes you a part of this religious tradition. Speaking the truth. You don't need to pray. What you need to do is constantly, every day, and everything that you do is to be a person of honor and speak the truth all the time. If you speak the truth, there's no need to be seeking for forgiveness. Supporting your brethren. 
instead of charity, they have this real serious obligation that they have to take care of one another. And support for one another is extremely vitally important. Abandoning the old creeds. We don't need fasting. We don't need a day of atonement. We don't need a season of Lent. We don't need to have the month of Ramadan for fasting. We, we get rid of all of that. And we live our lives with, with speaking the truth and supporting each other. Purification is very important. Going to a holy site like Mecca, traveling to the city of Jerusalem to go to the Western Wall for a time of prayer. A pilgrimage like that is not necessary. Going into the holy city of, of Jerusalem uh, at the time of um, the Passover uh, and to go there for the uh, traditions of Christianity to follow the way of the cross is not necessary. Living your life in purity is necessary. That's a little bit different. Accepting the unity of God. God is one and there is no other. And submitting to the will of God. It's not jihad as the um, traditional understanding in Islam was of this struggle to overcome the things that kept you from God and the inner struggle that human beings go through. This is, no, you just submit your life to the will of God all the time. And you try to live according to these principles, all of them. And this is how you demonstrate your religious tradition and your religious faith. The men have certain traditions. They shave their heads and they cover themselves with a white turban. Men will grow a mustache and a beard. And that is very important. Women will wear a white headscarf called the niqab. Uh, you cover your head all the time, constantly. The most pious among women hide all of their hair under a separate covering, the arachia. Um, they are forbidden to eat pork, to smoke, or to drink alcohol. Purity is very important. Um, dangers of things like, uh, you know, in, in the Middle East, particularly in um, in, in times before the creation of refrigeration, eating some foods was really a deadly thing to do. We all know the dangers of smoking, drinking alcohol is forbidden. These are things to try and keep the person and their life pure and uh, pious. Druze women <coughs> can attain positions of religious significance, and some have indeed achieved high rank. Regarding personal status, the rights of women are almost identical to those of men. It is a very forward-thinking religious tradition, and women are very much rewarded and acknowledged to be in positions of leadership, and it's basically open. Druze women are preferred over men in joining the Ukal because they are considered to be better spiritually prepared than men are. They can become more prominent readers and understanding uh, of the faith than men can because of their spiritual uh, level that is much higher than that of men. So women have a pretty prominent role in the society uh, of the Druze tradition. Since there is no ritual, there is no ceremony, there is also no sanctification of physical places. We don't set aside something to be a, a mosque or a church or a temple. Every place has this kind of sacredness, and we don't have to have any rituals or ceremonies to set that up. However, what has happened is that they will have gatherings at significant places. And over the course of time, these gatherings have really taken on the meaning of a religious holiday. Most of the regional assembly places are located in the upper and the western part of Galilee, uh, up in the Golan Heights. And one of the places that is very prominent in the Druze tradition, in a place where uh, the Druze will get together to gather, and what becomes almost a, a type of religious holiday, is on Mount Carmel. 
One of the most important Druze gathering sites is the tomb of Nebi Sha'ib, uh, otherwise known in the uh, Hebrew and Christian scriptures as Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. Um, it is located at uh, what is known as the Horns of Hittin. It overlooks uh, the Sea of Galilee. And they will gather up there on a regular basis to, well, commemorate the life of Jethro and his role as a prophet in the, uh, in the tradition. Sabalam's tomb it was a Druze, uh, Druze pro, uh, prophet uh, believed to be Zebulun, the sixth son of the patriarch Jacob. And Nabi al Khedar is the name that is given to the prophet Elijah. These are all people who play a prominent role in the traditions of the Druze. They are now beginning to be kind of almost uh, a religious holiday uh, when people gather together at these different places where these prominent leaders of the community uh, were, were buried. That is the end of our slides here for today. The Druze is a very interesting religion. Monotheistic, fiercely monotheistic. No national aspirations whatsoever. They're understanding that the religious tradition is how you live your life. You don't need to have ceremonies. You don't need to have rituals. You don't need to have fasting. You don't have to have any of this stuff because this should be incorporated in your day-to-day -day living. But what we have seen is the Druze have taken many of their traditions from Islam, from Judaism, from Christianity, from the Greek philosophers, from Hinduism. They've gathered all of these things together and they have created this space for themselves in the world. The only way you can become a Druze, you gotta be born into it. If you're not born into the tradition, then you can never become a part of it. A very fascinating group of people, very prominent people, and as we were showing in the slides, uh, people who, wherever they find themselves living, become very dedicated to the country where they live, to be living a prominent and peaceful life and supporting the good of that nation. Uh, wonderful organization, wonderful group of people, and uh, powerful tradition that they do have. So we're going to finish up there for today, and we're going to pick up again next Friday with another class uh, going on with our traditions of syncretistic religions. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. We'll look for you next week.